Okay, let me start to have the class public health one, week three. Unbelievable, time is going so fast. Um, before we will start the class, um, I know that I received some emails, some questions uh, about the presentations. Uh, the week fifth actually will be the first uh, group one to five to have the presentations. So myself and uh, Jamie, teaching assistant, we are looking forward to listen to your presentations. It's always like the best part in the class to listen like you, your, you know, as a future public health professionals to express your thoughts and opinions and everything. So I know there were a few questions. So um, uh, first, um, remember in syllabus, uh, there is the rubric that you need to follow through the presentations. Uh, also, be sure that you have 15 minutes. Uh, another thing is also is that you are the whole group. There are like 10 or 11 people working on the project. Um, and this is like, I would like that you have the experience of public health team. So inside the team, you decided uh, already probably, I hope, uh, who is like leader, uh, who is the manager, who will be responsible uh, for different portions in the presentation. Uh, you can have two managers, you can have two leaders, uh, organizers, whatever way you will decide. So this portion, I will leave that on you because you need to develop a little bit of skills. I'm much more letting you know, like, please, this is the due now to submit the table and let us know who is responsible for what. So a little bit like <clears throat> giving you guidelines, but I would like that you will have a little bit experience. Don't worry if you have uh, not always good experience, if some of the leaders you have to be really checking and so-called like bugging the other people that they will, you know, submit you because it's the real experience from the life. So whatever experience you have, if it's positive, it's great. If it's negative, it's great too, because always remember it's the learning process. So you always learn from that, whatever experience it is. So that's very important part, uh, like one, for that experience from presentations. Another part is, I know it was a little bit confusion about the um, short three minute video, you know, like, uh, or I mean not video, audio, as I sent that to you. So. Uh, um, I would like to clarify on that two things. One thing is the final, final presentation that you present in front of your class. So this final presentation, uh, there is no audio, no video, nothing like that. So you will have the presentation, you have your slides, and you have to follow the guidelines on the syllabus. Uh, you can make decision how many of you would like to present. So again, because you are working as a group, try to find out uh, who is like, who would like to be ready to have the presentation. You don't need all of you to present, you just pick up like, okay, these are one or two or three people or four people as a presenters, or maybe one, pe one person. So it's up to you how the class works, uh, how uh, the groups works together. Be sure also that uh, sometimes, um, it's tricky because the person thinks, okay, so I will do presentation. So the person thinks like, oh, I'm not doing anything. I'm just being here and reading from the slides. This is wrong, okay? You cannot do reading from the slides. You have to really know everything what's going on. It's actually quite a hard position to be presenter because you need to understand everything. And, uh, you know, explaining that it quite like entertainment style and everything. So there is no, if you will be reading from the PowerPoints, the group will be receiving uh, minus points. So it's not like standing here and reading on the slides. You need to know what's there and you need to give examples. And remember you are just using like 24 font, um, the size uh, on the PowerPoints. So it cannot be all information here. It's just the basic. And remember also that information here everybody can read so they can see that they can read that but you need to explain that as a presenter okay so be ready so it's quite important position uh, being presenter it's not just yes I'm here and reading that sometimes if you need and you need to have like small paper <coughs> and just the paper here just to check like the follow-up everything that's fine because even the big presenters and lecturers they have some kind of notes but you have to you know explain that so this is the presentation. 
the video, the audios that I told you to finish that and uh, post that to Digital Dropbox, it's, uh, it's just part for us justification that you did your work because it can happen sometimes and this is something that you can learn also for your professional life that if you will be in the group maybe you are already doing your work but maybe some other people will not see that you are doing your work and they will come and complain while we don't think that this person was bringing the fair amount of work to the whole team so now you can learn like well i have here my justification this is something that you can show when you will be in the professional life also always to keep your email communication and also to have your file what you did so this is the thing that maybe um, uh, if you are each of you responsible for certain portion so this is that you will submit this portion this two or three minutes audio what did you do on you know what was your fair part that you added to your whole public house team um, maybe two of you are working on specific section so if both of you are working in the fair work together so you can make that three minutes um, audio together and then like yes we did this and we did the you know a uh, fair amount of work and we did, we did that together so this is for me to have that there i can check that but in case because i remember also in that syllabus um, in the rubric i'm asking you questions that you will do evaluation of uh, another group but you will do also evaluation how did you work inside the group so i can have like justification for that so that's one reason. Another reason is that you will learn how to do audios because you will be doing that more and more and especially in additional public health classes, you will be applying the audios because uh, in case you will be sending um, uh, the proposals or you would like to be re uh, wanted to reach another human resources, CEO, you already know how to prepare the audios because you will have that tools and everything. It's posted on the class website. So you know how to do that so it's like um, you know I'm using one thing and I'm you are getting two things one justification and learning something like this for you for the future yes this is the thing that I did plus learning how to do audios yeah there were some questions in the back so is the three yeah uh, it so is basically saying what you did yeah so the audio if for example you will be working on small portion so that small portion, you probably collected resources, you maybe develop uh, the PowerPoints for your small portion. So you will put that, uh, you can do PDF form, you can do PowerPoints. So it needs to be something that I will see what you did, plus explanation what you did. So it can be on individual level, or if there are two of you, and I think probably not more than two, you are on uh, some of the specific topic working also together. So you can do that together, that small, you know, justification. Yes, we were in the specific section on that. I did this portion, I did this portion, but this was the one component of the whole presentation. So you can do it also together. But I think it's quite, uh, there will be noted that maybe three of you will be working on one uh, subsection. I think mostly I recommend just one or two of you will be working on small subsections under the whole presentation. Okay, is it explaining enough? Is it now? I know it was a little bit confusion about it. So now it's everything clear with that. I know I received like email. Wow, if everybody uh, needs to do the audios, then if we calculate that, it will be so much more minutes. So, you know, more than 15 minutes. So I was like, well, no, it's not the part of the presentation of the final presentation. This is something that you will be uploading and you are receiving, I believe, like three or four points. Uh, on individual level that you submitted that. And it's again, in case there will be some kind of dispute or something like that, yes, here is the information what the person did. And this is something that you can learn, again, as I mentioned, for your professional life so that you know like, well, <coughs> this is something that I will have that in case I will show that, yeah. So when is the audio actually due? So it's also, if it's group one to five, so for the group one to five, you have the same like uh, week fifth. So for you, uh, the due is the before you have the presentation, okay? So that's for group one to five. Group six uh, to 10, again, before your final presentation, it's the same, you have to submit that, okay?
clear everything and you have tools about how to do the, um, you know, the audios. And this will be, I think it can be quite exciting because it will be the first time, it doesn't need to be yet in a professional way, just learning the process. And then you will be going through many of my different public health classes. You will be doing and repeating the same. So it's almost guaranteed when you will receive your bachelor degree, you will be so excited to have presentations. You will love to have presentations. You will be asking like, oh, you will go to professional life and you will be asking like, oh, I would like to have presentations. And you will be completely confident um, you know, if the CEO of other company um, uh, will refuse and tell you like, oh, we don't have time to listen to your presentations, we don't have time of 15 minutes, we will t you will, you know, respond to them, well, it doesn't matter, I have, you know, five minutes audio and I will send it to you and that will be professionally done. So you will be prepared, you will be prepared for the life, you know, professional life outside, okay, and you will be confident and you will be doing that with enthusiasm, I hope so, okay. Clear everything? Yeah. No confusion? Are you looking for that? For that? I think, yeah, why not? Okay, so if no more questions, so now let's start and continue with epidemiological studies. Uh, remember, I finished on that level, so we talk about intervention study, cohort study, and case control study. And um, I started a little bit to, to talk. Um, about uh, intervention studies, so now we will go a little bit more into detail. So when you are preparing, so these three uh, studies are the basic studies in epidemiology. You will learn the calculations and everything when you really will take the classes in epidemiology. This in public health one, introduction of public health, I would like just to share that information with you with importance and with differences in each of the study. So if you look on the intervention study, you have actually two groups that they are very close together and the intervention is the difference. Uh, sometimes the same group can be on its own control group and it's uh, only in case that you will do the baseline, you will collect the data in the beginning, uh, maybe four weeks or eight weeks, and then you will do intervention. Intervention, what is the meaning of intervention? It means that you will, you will learn through uh, research studies that if you will be doing the specific public health education to the group, they can improve uh, any kind of the health outcome. So this is like public health intervention. So you are like intervening. So this slide is showing different examples of intervention studies. Uh, of course, you would like also to do randomized study, double blind study, because uh, later when we will be talking about the validity. So it means that um, this is, um, these are the studies that showing we, yes, this is the, high validity of the study of the process. So if there will be some questions on the midterm, what are the examples on intervention study? So, so what are the studies that they were using the intervention? Uh, so they are the examples of intervention studies. Uh, you are probably surprised like and thinking like, well, what is that aspirin to prevent heart diseases? So this is the intervention also. The pharmacological industry is doing intervention also. It means like I'm intervening not just through the health education, but I am giving the product. You are like beta carotene was given in case, you know, the group of the um, of, uh, experimental group in that intervention study. So intervention, it means you are doing something, you are adding something that the other group doesn't have, or the same group didn't have that in the beginning, but now it's changed and they are um, you know, following your recommendation. Uh, I wanted to share with you the headache intervention study and how I came for that intervention study. Uh, before, uh, uh, when you will make decision, yes, I would like to do the intervention, it's very important that you find the research uh, and going back. You uh, find out what is the topic that you would like to use for the intervention. Is it health behavioral modification? Is it dietary supplement? Are you using uh, antioxidants? Uh, are you recommending uh, eat uh, low dietary fat intake? So uh, some specific uh, intervention. Before you will go and making decisions about that, you also need to find out what is the problem is the house. So this is like uh, when I was doing the research and problems about the headaches. 
So uh, just if you look on that slide, so back 1988, that started to be classification on international level about different type of headaches. And uh, so you will find out there are different type of headaches and through your own research separately before you will go to clinical trial, which is the clinical study, you need to find out what are the other studies showing. Are there any correlations in um, lifestyle modification, uh, type of the food, medication, what is, uh, you know, what are the biomarkers of the disease? Because you would like to concentrate a little bit on that. This is something that you will be doing as a measurement. So then, of course, when I did the research on the headaches, um, I have to find out what type of headache I will be concentrating. Is it the regular headaches, there are migraine headaches, cluster type of headaches, tension type of headaches? And because you would like to have these uh, participants in the study, you need also to ask them questions. You need to prepare a survey. So you need to ask them questions, what type of symptoms they have, and making the classification, well, this goes to the migraine headache, tension type of headache, or cluster type of headache. So they were the classification, or they were the problems uh, with migraine headaches, because if, um, if the participants, they would like to be in the study, or you randomly uh, were able to get these participants, and they are not going um, you know, through this criteria, then could be some variations and it will not uh, completely fit also to your study. So you need to be sure and classify the disease. So this was the tension type of headache, so you can see there are a little bit differences um, with the problems and with the pain, and they were also about the cluster type of the headaches. Then another thing is that why I decided for the headache, and many times you decide for different type of diseases, you can decide also for diabetes or some symptoms from diabetes based on you know great presentation that you have last week. So uh, if you check some studies, you will find out, wow, this is amazing. So much money are spent you know, just uh, for the public, for the population to deal with the headaches. So we should really do something about that. You are public health providers. Uh, if you look on that, how many working days uh, people are missing because of the headaches? And you probably can associate yourself with that. How can you study if you have a headache? It's hard. You cannot remember, you cannot study, so you would like to do something that you don't have the headaches. So imagine now that you have some people, some participants in the study and just public, that they have headaches on everyday basis, constantly. So this is really a very big problem and annoying pain that they would like you know, to minimize that. So you also try to find out the group uh, and you know, what is the problem with the disease. This is just the example that I got from the uh, New Choice magazine, September 1999. So if you look on that, most headaches are dangerous to your house. And if the headache is, you know, the pain in the same uh, level, don't worry about that. Do you think, can you agree? No, this is, and this was 1999, so this was coming as a message to the public. Uh, I like this citations because sometimes, you know, people think like, well, if it's so simple, maybe it's not completely scientific or maybe they think like, well, it cannot be true because it's so simple. So be aware about that. So and realizing even if it's simple, why not to go ahead for that? And this is like the epidemiology and statistics connected with this. Uh, another thing I wanted to share with you, be always like open-minded and your eyes really wide open all around you, know, you from the public health perspectives. And I was sharing a little bit that approach, the awareness when I was showing to you West Nile virus um, infectious disease. It's, if you look on the historically, uh, there were already some correlations between headaches and diabetic patients that was possible to find out and actually how I came for and sometimes it's coming through the accident uh, to the research studies because when I was working with diabetic patients um, we put them uh, in that center when I was working we put them on the low dietary fat intake and after and you know special recommendations on eating style and after four weeks they came back and they were of course improving and they told me hmm, by the way I don't have headaches so I was like wow this is one participant one patient another patient four patients, fifth patients by the way I don't have headache I didn't know that 
diabetic patients have headache in that time. So I put attention to that and I just realized and I was going through the research and I found out that also it's correlated, you know, problems with higher uh, dietary fat intake or a high level of the cholesterol in the blood. It's correlated partially with diabetes, but also it's connected um, with uh, headaches. So then I was going more and more to the research and if you look, Back 1969 was, uh, 1969 was showing the research that, yes, high level of the free fatty acids was correlated, um, you know, with the headaches. And some, if, if they use the medication, the, um, um, the level of the free fatty acids was possible to decrease and was also decreased the problem with the headache. So this is the research. So it's actually like great, it's like detective work. You know, you find something and you think like, wow, what is the background of the other things? So you start to go through different resources. So it's really, you know, amazing things to try to find out, like suddenly you're surprised and one thing is connected with the other thing. So then I came to the project to do uh, this intervention study. So. Again, what I mentioned before, you have to get uh, the clients or the participants uh, in the study that they have similar problems with the headaches. So the study will, and you have to do design of that. You need to, through the literature, find out well, pre some kind of predictions also and see on other uh, literature when can be some kind of changes. So usually what you were able, what I was able to see with the diabetic patients after four weeks. So just to be sure, so it was extended like for eight weeks, if there will be any changes. Uh, also, you have to have patients that they have the minimum like once per month headache, because if it will be less, it's maybe every two months, then you cannot get it in your study. So you have to do some specific criteria in order to get them um, uh, uh, you know, the population uh, for your study. So then you need to collect the data. You have to have questionnaires, you have to do additional objective measurements. Remember, this is very important. Even if you do whatever level of the behavioral study, if you have and you are providing intervention study, clinical trial, it's good to have some objective measurements. What objective measurements could be? Maybe uh, blood pressure, maybe percentage of body fat, that it's very easy to measure, or also uh, the blood test. What is the level of total cholesterol or LDL? Something what is very easy to get, so you have to have like support for your um, study. And then, of course, headache because headaches, uh, you know, headache was problem, that was the thing that we were trying to measure. So you have to develop the scale of the pain. Uh, this was from zero to five uh, that the uh, participants were writing there. When you measure the dietary fat intake, you can have uh, different um, software and measurements. Uh, uh, participants were keeping the uh, journal, what they were consuming, and it was surprising. Sometimes they, I went through like 10 days and there was no one single intake of water. You would be thinking, how come? Well, people were thinking, well, if I'm drinking soda drinks, this is the liquid, <laughs> I'm okay. But no water, no single water. Uh, so also uh, you do the measurements of uh, what was because you, I concentrated on dietary fat intake. So I may measure what was during the baseline or what was the control group and what are the changes, what is the differences after your intervention. So you can see there were big changes in consumption of dietary fat intake. It was coming from 122 to the lowest, it was like 72 grams. So, so you can see also based on that, there were some differences. There was some kind of measurable outcome with that specific uh, population. So because I gave them intervention to decrease the dietary fat intake. And because they decreased the dietary fat intake, they started to consume more fruits and vegetables. And because of that, they started to do more physical activity. So they are like additional variables, so-called in uh, <coughs> epidemiological uh, terminology, that you can find uh, there. But the intervention was low dietary fat intake. So if you look on that, there were the dietary changes. So they were really able to decrease that. The study was done for three months. And there were additional changes uh, with vitamins and minerals that they were uh, you know, consuming. 
So what happened also, these are the, the additional uh, results from the study and many times it happens something like that. You do intervention, you intervene with one topic. So the topic was low dietary fat intake in that time. I didn't make um, differences if it's omega-3 fatty acids or saturated fat, just general dietary fat intake. It would be better, remember this was the study done back 1999. So it would be better now, yes, do low level of saturated fat and maybe having you know, more omega-3 fatty acids, but in that time it was just saturated, uh, just fat on its own. But you can see they also increase intake of water. So from this, if you have one intervention study, you can find out, wow, well, now I can do another study and maybe with the uh, intake of the water. So it's a really beautiful detective work. It's like exciting. I know you are sitting now in the classroom and you are already listening that the study was done, but if you are inside the study, it's exciting because you always like, wow, this is coming out. Can I use that? Intake of water, is any study done about that? Uh, correlations between headache patients and water. Nobody did that. Oh, this is another way that I can start, you know, study and I can do intervention in that way. So it's, it's amazing, you know, exciting things that if you are inside the study. Also, as you notice, was a decreased intake of coffee. Some people could, uh, you know, just argue, well, of course, because you decreased the, you know, intake of coffee, therefore the headaches were uh, decreased. But actually, justification for that is, if they started to decrease the coffee, they could be in withdrawal symptoms. They could have withdrawal symptoms, so it means they could have more headaches. So it's justification if they didn't have more headaches, that really the dietary fat intake was working in the proper way. So there are many of that associations, and many different things that you have to find out the justification, because even this, if you find out these results, how you will justify that, how you will explain the pathophysiology and physiology and chemistry and biochemistry inside the body, how come uh, this came out, are there any correlations with the headaches? And of course, this, uh, for example, is vitamin B6, we found out they are the precursors for uh, forming the neurotransmitter serotonin. So if the serotonin is low, there is the problem with headaches. And then any uh, behavioral modification in order to have additional like uh, support of your intervention if it's connected with behavioral modification. Not always you can do double blind study as pharmaceutical industry does. So in case pharmaceutical industry does intervention study, so it means they are giving the medication uh, so that's intervention. They can do double blind. Nobody knows uh, what the participant is receiving. Is it really the medication, or it's just uh, the, or is it the placebo uh, tablet, or it's nothing that they are just swallowing something and thinking that's the medication. So nobody knows. Even the uh, maybe one person in the whole study, but nobody. Even if they are intervening and communicating with the participants, they don't know who is receiving what. This behavioral modification, it's hard because you would like, it actually depends how you will explain that, how you will be doing the persuasion and talking with the participants. So it's very hard, you cannot do double blind study. So it's good to have objective justification. So therefore it was the blood test and you can see that was um, in, the, in the quite strong and in positive uh, correlation that uh, yes, it is true, it's not just making mark on the survey, yes, I was eating less of the dietary fat, because you know that could be some biases, we will talk about that later. So it was really possible to see if the blood tests were showing low level of cholesterol, so the person was really eating less amount of dietary fat intake. So this was the intervention study. I concentrated and I was giving you example of that headaches because this was the study that is very, very close to my heart and I still continue to do uh, research on that. And I was hoping that by giving you example about the headaches uh, that you will remember the intervention study. Next one, you have the cohort study. So a cohort study, what is very important from this slide to remember is that you have a large number of healthy people and collect data on their exposure and track outcomes over time. So this is difference. You can see this is the basic, basic difference to compare this intervention. 
you are intervening here you are just you know you're collecting that and you are uh, tracking over the time so differences is that with intervention you are involved that you make the decision how the intervention is going what the participants will be doing or swallowing or whatever with cohort study you you are passive in that it's the active process of that participants in the study you are just observing that and and collecting the data but you are not doing anything actively so that's cohort study examples of cohort study it's the famous famous framingham heart study and you already know uh, back before the study started we didn't know the correlations between cholesterol and uh, cardiovascular problems so this was again this was the study that you were observing through the time uh, we can tell also about it like prospective study so you have the healthy group of people and then um, you are just observing whatever exposure they did to themselves so if there will be the questions about examples of cohort study. So this is the slide that you need to know. Uh, case control study. So this is something that you are going retrospectively. So remember, I'm just a little bit uh, using words like prospective, retrospective. Be sure that you know that because this is connected with each of that study and there will be definitely questions uh, on the midterm. You will be not doing any form of calculations, but you need to know these terms. So case control study, it means that again, you have the healthy control group of individuals. You, you choose a healthy control group of individuals as similar as possible to cases. And then you are going retrospectively what they did differently. So again, you are comparing uh, case because it's cases so you are comparing groups one group is healthy and uh, you go back 10 years and another group is not healthy but they have very similar so they are maybe very similar social economic situation uh, maybe similar age uh, maybe similar you know location so you would like to uh, prevent any additional confounding factors so they could be quite similar and you are going back retrospectively so how come why this group of people are healthy and why this group of people have disease what what happened what was the different maybe this group were eating uh, garlic and this group didn't eat the garlic so this is something what you need to find out so this is another part of epidemiology it's quite exciting because you are doing detective work yeah um since it's the least accurate approach like the data is off like why do you well, because it's not expensive. Okay, so it's, uh, yeah, fast and cheap. <laughs> so, and you would like, well, well, another thing you have to remember is that sometimes you need to find out, is it possible, is there any correlation? So you would like quickly to find out, is there something? So if you do this, uh, based on that, you can start to do maybe intervention study or maybe you know additional studies that they will be proving, or I mean not proving, I shouldn't use the word of proving, but showing like, yes, there are uh, definitely correlations. So this is very you know easy, very quickly. And also like now at this moment, if this group have the disease, you would like to find out, is there something like I should be ever, so they can do it very quickly. So there are good questions that you ask about that. So uh, I'm going uh, to the end of the chapter five. So you already know the differences between incidence and prevalence. I know we talked a little bit about that. Incidence is uh, connected with the new cases, is it right? And prevalence is combination new and old cases. So it's very simple, as I uh, mentioned that to you. It's a little bit more insight and more calculations, but it's the basic things with that. And uh, this one, we already, I think already I asked you before the questions, you are already familiar with that, about the who, when, and where. So I think I asked you about that. And be sure that you can explain the epidemiological studies, what are the differences, and what could be the different topics maybe of the diseases also, what kind of you know, study you will be using. You already saw the um, uh, video clip on the epidemiology. So now I'm moving uh, to chapter six. To share with you problems and limits. We have uh, problems and limits uh, in, in epidemiology. So with the intervention study, 
Um, sometimes, you know, you are thinking, and you probably saw on that slide that was written, uh, like, I think I believe it was like 54, page, for 54 participants were involved in that headache intervention study. And you would be thinking, like, how come? How come you came exactly to 54? Actually, I started with 96. <laughs> so this is uh, because, of course, uh, if you prepare the study and you will have also later, I think it will be after midterm, to have a guest speaker to talk about the IRB, about the ethics uh, in research and uh, institutional review board. Um, so there is also so-called like informal consent this is something that the participants, uh, uh, you know, have the information about the whole study. And they also have the right any time to stop uh, the study. If they don't feel comfortable or if they just feel like they don't want to, so they don't need to follow that. And sometimes there are different things happening in their life or maybe they realize, well, it's too much for me. I don't want to keep the food journals. So they just decide not to be in the study. So sometimes um, it could be the problem in that. Sometimes you're not so sure if they are really keeping uh, the specific recommendations that you tell them based on that uh, writing or the information. So, uh, so that could be like the uh, problems uh, with uh, the intervention study. Uh, with the cohort study, sometimes uh, there are additional um, factors or variables that you cannot divide and make distinction or this is really connected with this or not. It also depends how completed the study is prepared. And case control study, so again, uh, it could be some additional errors based uh, if, you know, if they are uh, involved, if they report all the uh, situations or not. So it's, it's always you have some kind of dropouts, um, you know, in that studies. Additional sources of errors, uh, and you need to be aware about that, and when you will be doing different calculations in epidemiological classes, classes on epidemiology, you will learn more about that, but I just wanted to let you know. So sometimes uh, it's the problem with randomization. Randomization needs to be done, so it's the randomized. Sometimes you have to put the numbers uh, to the participants and just randomly pick up the numbers that they will be participating in the study. If the randomization is not properly done, then you can think like, oh, this study is showing, yes, there is a correlation. And maybe it's not because it was just the purpose. There was something already common uh, that uh, the randomization was not done in the proper way. Sometimes could be additional confounding factors in the study, so that are like doing the misleading uh, in that the, the whole study and selection biases or reporting that. Uh, sometimes it's called like Haftforn effect, so it's quite correlated and connected with um, intervention study. So it means, yes, I am influencing through my discussion and uh, explaining to the participants why they need to follow the specific behavior. So I am uh, like, it's the biases that the person who is doing the intervention can influence the mind and decision of the participants. So they would like that it will work whatever if, if uh, there can be another person who is the intervention. So there are different um, biases and sources of errors um, in the studies. You would like to be sure that the study is really strong to have a good uh, number of the participants. You need, therefore, when I explained to you about the headaches and about the you know, research that was done in the past, you would like to know the biological explanation. If you will start to do some kind of study and you have no clue or thinking like what could be maybe correlated or maybe it's not really based on some kind of biological explanation, you can get some study without, um, you know, no results or it's um, uh, confusing. So that's very important. And also a large study population, because if you will see, it's really uh, on the large scale. So it means, yes, maybe it's in the right direction. And sometimes it's good if you do, and when I did the study, uh, with the headache patients, nobody in that time did the uh, intervention like recommending low dietary fat intake. But the consistency was a little bit from the past because they were recommending medication to patients that medication was decreasing 
the level of the fat in the blood, the free fatty acids and level of cholesterol, and patients improve or participants improve the headaches, decrease the problem with headaches. So even the intervention was not done as a behavioral modification, there was some kind of consistency or biological explanation. So this is another very important thing when you decide for the research. Uh, it's very important, um, you know, uh, because sometimes uh, if you have, uh, and it can happen a few times, uh, I remember many years back um, that was on the radio, before it was always information, yes, if you are consuming dietary fibers, you are decreasing the risk for colon cancer or uh, cancer on its own. Uh, then suddenly came study and showing, yes, it doesn't look like, um, no, actually no, it doesn't look like um, intake of dietary fibers will be connecting or preventing the risk of the colon cancer or other cancers. So now it's like misleading information. So what you have to do as a public health provider, immediately check how the study was designed. Uh, and if this, all the things that I mentioned before about the biological explanation and also the intervention. So what was the problem with that study was that they decided for small amount of dietary fibers as a consumption for the participants. So we should consume more than 30 uh, grams of dietary fibers. So if they consume lower amount, they did not see the results and that was quite misleading the information. So if you see some study pro and some study contra, find out how was the methodology done? What was really, and maybe what was the, uh, what, was the what are the characteristics of the population? Ethical issues, um, you will have that, uh, 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 you will get, get the speaker about that, so that will be more explanation about that, based on uh, many of that um, involvement of not proper approach about the research, not about the uh, informed consent uh, for participants and doing some research that public was not informed of what's going on, or sometimes, you know, it was, uh, uh, not given in, uh, medication and uh, so that was knowing that if the medication will be not given there will be um, uh, progression of the disease that was not based on the proper level of the ethics so uh, therefore uh, all uh, organizations and uh, universities they have the institutional review board that every research even if you are preparing for the Europe uh, so every research have to go through this um, uh, specific review to check that you are following the proper level of uh, the uh, ethical issues. So again, I will be not going deeper in that because you will have the guest speaker. Uh, sometimes there are conflicts of interest in drug tri trials. Uh, so that's another thing that you need to be aware about that. Uh, if there is the development of medication, uh, it needs to go to, through the specific stages to be sure that uh, it's not, it's minimize the harm uh, to the population. Discussioners. Um, we already talked about intervention cohort and case control, so I will let you to do this as a homework because if you go and you explore this portion, uh, that will be something that you will be, you know, preparing yourself for the midterm. But you already know, we already talk what are the important things and what are the differences and what are the uh, part of this that will make uh, each of the study either, uh, you know, advantages in the way it's quick, it's cheap, or it's with high, um, you know, validity and credibility. This is the website. I don't know how come uh, it's uh, light uh, on that slide. Maybe you have to go to, uh, not through the PDF form, but to the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, this is the center talking about the ethics <coughs> issue. So this is quite important. This is something that whatever research you will be doing, just to check the center and see if there are any discrepancies or what is the problem now on local level, on the global level. Uh, now I would like to share with you specificity and sensitivity. So this is closing a little bit part about the epidemiology. And 
we are going now to chapter 7, which is about the statistics. And I wanted to check also the sensitivity and specificity. You have this link uh, in your class uh, website. Maybe you heard the word sensitivity, specificity, false positive, false negative. So this is the explanation. Again, you will be not doing any calculations in this class. But if you are going through the definition of sensitivity, how we will define the sensitivity. So this is something that you would like that it's really true. So it means that if the person is, um, you know, it has the disease, the person really have the disease. So this is very important table. It will help you even for the future epidemiological classes or statistics classes. So uh, in order to develop the test is sensitive. So sensitive, it means you apply the test, and if it's written like, yes, this is the test with high sensitivity, so it means it's detecting the person who has the disease. So that's very important. So that's the sensitivity. So person has disease, it's, uh, has the disease, and uh, uh, when it detects the disease, it's showing me the test, uh, the person has disease, and the person really has the disease. Specificity, so it's telling me the person doesn't have the disease and really the person is free of disease. So you would like to have the test, of course, with high sensitivity and high specificity. Sometimes some tests have one more and one less. And then you can also have, therefore, like false positive results or false negative results. If you think about that, uh, you would like, of course, minimize the errors as much as possible because, yes, here is, I would like to go through the definitions and then I will show you the examples. The false positive is when test reports a positive results for a person who is disease free. So what do you think? Is it important in public health? Yes. Okay, what can happen? <laughs> Uh, before, therefore, sometimes we have to do another test, you know, just to support the diagnosis. Because if it's a false positive, so it's probably high level of stress. The, uh, it's showing like yes, you are positive for this disease, and actually the person is disease free. So of course, at the end, it's great uh, news. <laughs> but during the process, before coming to the news could be really very high level of the stress that can maybe happen some situations that you don't want from public health perspectives because uh, it depends also on the type of the disease the person received the information. So that's false positive. So then what do you think about false negative? Would you like to have also false negative? So it means false negative occurs when the test reports a negative results for a person who actually has the disease. You don't want to have either, do you? No, because what can happen? It's, it's that in that situation, if person receives this information, so maybe for the next testing, person will go after one year or maybe two years. And then during the time, it's maybe progression of the disease already. So either way, you would like to minimize that. So therefore, it's very important to find the biomarkers on the disease and based on that to develop the, the best you know, tools for minimizing uh, the, the, the outcome that we don't want is associated. So now you have a little bit information about uh, sensitivity and uh, specificity. So here we are coming to the statistics. Remember we talk about the different disciplines in public health. So we finish part of the epidemiology. I know it's not just for one or two <laughs> uh, lectures, it, it's more, but it's just giving you a little bit idea what you can expect in epidemiology. So statistics. Uh, this was like introduction to you a little bit how important are you know, the numbers uh, in the public health field. We need to have the numbers and uh, 
it's not uh, moving. Okay, uh, because uh, the numbers, if you generally think about public health field, uh, and you are, you know, collecting. Remember, we talk about local level. What uh, the public health department is doing on the local level, collecting the data, collecting the numbers. And based on that, uh, is, uh, it, it is evaluated and making some specific measurements. So we need to have that statistics because uh, how come uh, we will find out that maybe uh, in specific location it shows that uh, there is um, people, uh, th there is the higher number, uh, statistical numbers occurring higher with the, uh, I mean, occurring with the breast cancer, and in other location not. So you would like find out why is that? So you will do research in that direction, or you think like, okay, this is the problem, and I have to develop public health program and to decrease the problem. So we really need to have numbers on its own. Um, if we talk about statistics, so uh, also the numbers, partially the numbers are telling me uh, what is the repetition, how can I um, also assume or predict occurrence of some kind of problems. But uh, should I use statistics like that, for example, if I will have, there will be the patient, the patient is going to the physician office, and the physician will tell the patient, well, based on the statistics, uh, your results with your cancer, um, you have just five months to, to live. You will die after five months, based on the statistics. Is it good to tell information like that to the patient? This is, this is, this is not, I will be not using <laughs> the statistics in the proper way, okay? So uh, statistics, the numbers can help me, but uh, maybe some of you will be in my alternative complementary medicine. So some situation, I can probably, somebody will be arguing, well, I have to tell the patient if it's this type of the cancer, number four, uh, so uh, statistics are showing uh, that it's really five months uh, to survive. But we have to tell that in the proper way is the statistics showing that, but it doesn't always mean that the statistics, it, it's, it's connected on completely on individual level. Because you will learn from alternative complementary medicine that maybe there are, they call it like anecdotal stories. So it means that the person is changing probably lifestyle, changing different things, and maybe it's possible to you know, extend the time or reverse the process. So we cannot tell to the patients in this way. We can tell maybe if we would like to share that information, we can tell like based on this um, uh, type of the uh, diagnosis the person has, um, many of that research literature is showing this, but it doesn't mean that can be correlated or connected with you. So that can be some, because this is like the open window. There is some kind of window that you need to keep that. And it's actually there uh, in the science of statistics. So probability, it's telling me that the probable things will probably, <laughs> usually happens. Uh, when you are preparing the study and the epidemiological studies, uh, do you remember we talk about how many people you will have in the study? So you also calculate the power of a study. So if you have, uh, it depends how uh, you calculate that, how many uh, participants will be in the study. If you have um, higher power uh, in that study, it means, yes, this, I mean, larger number confer the, the power. If, uh, if this is in the proper way, it means it's stronger study. Uh, statistics also, why we are, you know, we are using that for the screenings. Uh, here we talk about sensitivity, specificity. Uh, it's very important because if we do these different tests for HIV, for the newborn screening, uh, or if somebody is coming for the mammogram, we really need to be sure that the tests work in the way as uh, should be working. So I wanted to share with you uh, on this slide uh, some examples, uh, not completely from the medical field, but just <coughs> example about sensitivity, specificity, false positive, false negative. So what is this? And maybe you will, because it's like entertainment, so you will remember that. 
So, in the arena of spouse relations, a wife notices lipstick on husband's uh, shirt. So, what is that lipstick? Oh, positive test for what? Infidelity, probably. Okay. Uh, and worries about, yeah, infidelity. But she later verifies that her husband actually met with Aunt Jane at the lunch break, and um, old Aunt Jane missed her husband's neck um, with lipstick kiss and hit his, um, you know, shirt. So what is that? False positive finding, which was positive for female kiss, but negative for infidelity. So what do you think about that? Yeah? Funny? <laughs> I think so. So here is the example about false positive, you know, and false negative. So we have to actually be always sure, like, yes, this is the test. Therefore, sometimes you have more tests, or sometimes what the goal is to develop the tests, that they will be, um, you know, this minimal level of false positive or false negative. Rates uh, in the statistics, they are also <coughs> very important. Um, Mostly, I will talk about the crude rates and adjusted rates. So if I will ask you, uh, or you will make decision, should I go to live to Alaska, or should I go to live to Florida? And some you know, people are thinking about the different um, areas and locations, and they just check, well, we will check what is the mortality rate. And they will find out that, yes, in Florida, it's a very high mortality rate and less mortality rate in uh, Alaska. So they would be thinking, oh, I should be probably going and to live in Alaska. So do you think they can make a decision like that? No? OK, why not? Here you are, OK? Because if they made the decision, it was on the crude rate, OK? So you have the crude rate that you are, if the numbers, of course, based on the crude rate, it's telling me, yes, high, you know, um, uh, mortality rate is in Florida to compare with Alaska. But we know because based on the environment and based on the, um, how, you know, the, the movement, mostly the <clears throat> older population is moving to Florida. So of course, because it's a higher population, it's older population. So the adjustment based on the age group, um, if this is done, then you will see that almost there are not big differences uh, between Florida and Alaska. So you can make decisions or something else, but not about the mortality. So be aware also about this one. So if there are, you need to know <clears throat> from statistical perspectives, if this is influenced some, some, by something else, you have to do the specific adjustment. Uh, life expectancies. So this is, and again, sometimes, therefore I'm trying to show you like how statistics uh, are important in public health field. If you look on that table, uh, what you can see here is the life expect, oh, sorry, life expectancies at birth. So if you look on that, it's back 1980 and 1999, differences between uh, males and females, and also among the other countries. What you could assume is, or predict, yes, because it's um, you know, better public health infrastructure in the countries, uh, it's uh, the improvement in technology, so, and we always probably you hear about life expectancy is increasing. So do you, and it look, usually looks like the trend in that direction. If you look on that map, on the table, do you see something that is probably not going in that direction or something like suddenly being puzzled that something looks different as it should be looking? It's a little bit lower, so I don't know if, yeah. Well, I mean, Puerto Rico decreased um, the males like in 1980 to 1999. Okay, oh, you mean like Puerto Rico? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so this little bit decrease, yeah, do you need, do you see something uh, more? No. Why is it, um, why is Chile and Cuba missing so 
Uh, it's possible that maybe they didn't do, you know, they didn't have uh, that data, so that so we didn't have the data. Uh, but I would like that you look, it's actually now, I don't know why it's that black uh, sign here, but it's connected, if you look on the Russian Federation. Yeah. I'm doing coloring here, not knowing why. <laughs> yeah, now I disappeared. Okay, so Russian Federation. What do you think about that? Yeah, okay. So what do you think? So if you see that, and you are public health provider, maybe statistician, maybe public health educator, wow, yeah. Oh, do we have to say like, why do you think that happened? Yeah, whatever, whatever. Uh, any comments about that? What do you think? Okay, so there was political reason, probably, yeah. Um, why do females have a higher number than males? Uh, female has a higher? Um, yeah, so this is also a good, uh, good comment about that, because uh, it's still through the studies, it's showing that they have less occurrence of cardiovascular disease. It's just uh, at this moment, uh, because they also were engaged in less of uh, tobacco smoking and some kind of activities that the male are doing. Actually, statistics are showing that maybe in another 10, 20 years, it will be getting quite close. Um, there will be not big differences with the male and female. And they are thinking because um, there is high level of stress for the women because women in, men, I mean, in some of the countries, uh, they were not in the working process. Now, if you think about high level of stress, they are getting the high positions in the jobs and plus taking care of the family and all those things. So it's about the lifestyle and how much, you know, it's uh, exposure to the stress, exposure to the negative things and exposure being in some kind of activities that the male did. So women always were drinking less of alcohol, not smoking and all that because it was coming with, yes, um, uh, the women were uh, uh, getting children and pregnancy and everything. So on general terms, they were less consuming some of that or engage in the risky behaviors. But now it's coming to that. So it's not just on its own like predispositions, but also is on the um, uh, behavioral modification. So that's, uh, that's uh, correlated in that. So there are some predictions that will be quite close in the future. So that's the explanation to that. But if you look, yes, so if you see something like that from, that was actually excellent, um, you know, comment on that. So if you see something like that, you are public health provider. So you have to think like, okay, uh, was there any changes in the political situation? Uh, are there any changes uh, uh, because of the government or uh, the specific area or maybe the environmental problems that maybe could cause that? But of course, with the political situation, situation because uh, the change of the communist system so now suddenly there was no um, uh, like healthcare system because during communist system there was the uh, they were healthcare system for um, every person plus also there were specific restrictions with finishing the communist system now suddenly there was also a problem that how they saw the democracy so it was increased crime so that was the risk um, you know of that and also there was no done surveillance for infectious diseases. So it was coming from here, suddenly occurrence of uh, tuberculosis because there was not enough medication to finish uh, the process, cholera and all of that. Yeah, some comments. I think they had some like, really like, extravagant natural disasters there, or not just natural disasters, but man-made disasters, like yeah. Chernobyl and a couple yeah. other like, yeah. industrial, like, yeah, so this is another comment because during the communist system, uh, they didn't have uh, the specific uh, public health policy uh, how to prevent any of that situations. Uh, so that another thing is like why this happened. So yeah, okay. So yeah, this is excellent comment on that too. So if something happened like that, you have to check and uh, think like, well, Oh, another thing also would happen because of the change of the communist system, many people now suddenly didn't know because there was no kind of directions in the life. So there was higher consumption of alcohol and higher consumption also of uh, smoking because this was, especially some of the countries from the former communist uh, system, 
that was like 80% is, well, I'm talking about, I don't know if Paul, uh, Poland is here also, so that was also decreased. Uh, back 1995 in Poland was almost 80% of population were smoking. And it was, and started more occurrence of smoking among women. So it was now suddenly higher risk of occurrence of the lung cancer and additional diseases. Something similar, what is happening now a little bit with uh, improving the um, uh, economic situation in India. So it's higher occurrence of the smoking and smoking is correlated also with occurrence of diabetes. So if you look on some of that, you have to check all that behavioral modification, natural disasters, any situation like that and think like what can be done about that. Okay, life expectancies, risk perception, risk assessment. Uh, so this is also when you will be doing public health communication. This is another thing that you are using the statistics to find out uh, when there is whatever situations are happening, how you will be doing the behavioral modification. So this is just an example on different type of uh, activities uh, connected uh, with a different group of public, how they perceive the um, you know, risk situation. So this is another thing that we are using that for behavioral modification. And this is different form. The other one was table, and this is uh, like in the graph. Uh, when we talk about uh, calculation of the benefits that can be done through public health education, it's not always very easy to calculate the benefits. So therefore, many times, you know, it's challenging from public health perspectives because you think like, well, if we will do, you know, preventative measures and uh, healthcare uh, insurance uh, or health insurances will be supporting the preventative measures, they will save money in the future. But it's still that point to calculate immediately. It's not possible to see that. Uh, it's, it's quite hard immediately everything to calculate. So uh, it's not seen that what can happen in the future. So that sometimes the, the benefits, uh, the calculations could be harder. Uh, so what do you think? Why is statistics? Why is statistics so important for public health? And before, just think about that. And I would like to show you, um, I think I have the video clip here. I'm going to start off. Think about that and I will ask you. Um, and um, I just wanted to, uh, and I'm sure that this audience really needs no introduction to the major problem that we are facing, not only in this country, but uh, in many parts of the world, uh, with uh, this kind of what people are now calling a dual epidemic Look on the of numbers. obesity and uh, diabetes. And I put up this one slide, which just uh, actually has a few of the current statistics on it. Uh, first of all, it's now estimated that 65% or two-thirds of adult Americans are overweight if we use as a definition of overweight a body mass index of, of greater than 25. And 21% are obese uh, uh, if we use an index of a body mass index of greater than 30. So there's no question that we are an obese society. 24% uh, of adults would meet the ATP3 criteria for metabolic syndrome, uh, this clustering of central obesity, uh, elevated blood pressure, high triglyceride, low HDL cholesterol, and abnormal glucose metabolism. A very, very high risk population for developing diabetes and for developing cardiovascular disease. It's now estimated that there are about 21 million people in the U.S. who have diabetes, and of course, 90 to 95% are type 2, and there are even more who have impaired glucose tolerance. Uh, that number is very difficult to come by, but I've seen estimates as high as 40 million people in the U.S. with impaired glucose tolerance uh, who are at very high risk for progressing on to develop uh, type 2 diabetes. To me, a very frightening statistic, and the estimate that the lifetime risk of developing diabetes for people born in the year 2000, so that's the six-year-old kids running around now, is 33% for men, 
39% for women, and for Hispanic women, a particularly high risk uh, group, it's as high as 50% uh, lifetime risk of developing diabetes. Okay, so um, what do you think? Why is statistics so important for public health? You were thinking about, yeah, go ahead. Yes, this is excellent. Thank you for that comment. Yes, so this is, you will learn also in public health that whatever intervention or whatever program you are implementing and applying, you have to do also evaluation to see the numbers, if the numbers change. Because if you cannot, you have to show on something that uh, yes, there are the numbers because if you look on that and you remember the presentation that you have last, I mean, about the diabetes, the numbers, if you saw the numbers, you can a little bit like see, well, this is, if I will be telling you like, well, it's really the problem and so many people and I will be not using exactly the numbers, it's still not completely like you don't have uh, the picture of that situation. And uh, so it's very important the numbers um, in the public house because you will see do I need to do something about that or not. So therefore, um, statistic, oh, statistic is very um, important uh, in public house field. Um, you already saw that links. Uh, there are additional links also on your class website uh, about statistics. So it's showing you also the CDC so that you can get all different statistics about um, uh, mortality, about uh, infant mortality, uh, because this is also one of indicator to tell me about the nation, how uh, the nation is healthy. What is the level of that mortality for the infants? And I can see that statistics are showing me, I'm just joking about that, that you are ready for that five minutes that you had uh, from this class to do something for your house. I can see that everybody is ready to do something for your house. Is that correct? Yeah. So I will let you go under one condition. Laughing, smile, smile on your face. You cannot leave this classroom without a smile. Do nice breathing of fresh air and sinking fruits, vegetables, grains and beans for your lunch. 